was uh, formerly with Chumbi uh, until December. And Chumbi is one of, it was open source hardware, was one of the things that they did. And uh, you know, we did mass production of hardware, which I think is why I'm on this panel to talk about experiences there and so forth. Um, and, uh, and I'm an engineer as well. I build stuff. I like to build stuff. I like to take things apart. And I like to talk about doing that. I like to be open. Excellent. Uh, my name is Nathan Seidel. I started a Spark Fun Electronics nine years ago. It's a website on the internet where you can buy these little electronic bits. And we actually manufacture and build these devices in Boulder, Colorado. So nine years ago, it started with me in a bedroom. And then here we are today with 135 employees. We build about 60,000 widgets a month. And we ship this stuff all over the world. So you were asking earlier about suppliers. I was in the same situation you were 10 years ago, saying, where can I get this stuff? And I saw the void and decided to start my own company building this stuff. Uh, SparkFund <laughs> uses open source hardware as a business principle, as a business model. So we actually open source our designs so that uh, our customers can learn from us and we can learn from our customers. So I and I have worked together on some bits and Lee and I have worked together on some products as well. So collaboration is the core part of our business. Uh, my name is Leah Beakley. I'm a professor at the MIT Media Lab where I work with David on the last panel. Um, and uh, a project that I worked on when I was in graduate school turned into a collaborative project that I work on with Nathan. So Nathan manufactures and, and distributes um, a series of devices that kind of came out of some of my previous research and we continue to collaborate on that. So my first question may be maybe an obvious one, but when I, maybe when I, when I start thinking about businesses, the first thing I think about usually is in what can I give away as part of my business model. So when you started thinking, I know you, you all come to this from slightly different angles, but what made you think that open source hardware was a viable business model? And when you saw that, why did you say, well, open source hardware is the way that I want to go with this business that I've started? So I, I should just preface this by saying that the company is almost only six months old, so, so anything I say may or may not hold for another six months or a year, so ask me again if any of it is valid. But um, I, I, I believe that um, I believe that throughout civilization, we, um, we invented the best things, sharing them and building on top of each other's inventions. And, and then uh, one day the patent system came and started saying you have to put these blocks around your inventions and prevent other people from building. And that was um, that, so an interesting tool to, to protect uh, you know, your business, protect your ideas. But then it started becoming um, a very kind of defensive and, um, and counterproductive mechanism because you have companies that are in total lockdown that are preventing <coughs> other companies from innovating, preventing individuals from innovating. And it, it, it's become, it's a, I think it's a really broken system. And so, um, Little Bits is founded on the principle that uh, we want to turn uh, people into inventors and we want to kind of bring back this, this concept of making at a young young age um, for kids that used to, for our generation that play, and previous generation that played with Lego and learned about space and structural and how to be builders and how to think about the world. Uh, you know, today we need the equivalent for how you think about an interactive world, how you think about a world that is uh, built on electronics and so, um, in order for that to happen, um, there's either um, either I could have gone the Lego route, which is build a company over 50 years and uh, and plan every possible thing and and do that, or um, since I'm not very patient and I kind of wanted to jump all that, I um, I believe that open source was the way to go because um, when the, uh, the, the 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 sort of the basis is out there, people would contribute to it. It would uh, start to proliferate faster. It becomes useful for everybody. Well, I mean, for Chumbi, I mean, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is Chumbi is a software company. They're not a hardware company. A lot of people think that because we made hardware, we're a hardware company. The, the, the business model was to build a platform uh, on which the software would run. At the time when we introduced Chumbi, if you don't know what it is, it's this basically this app platform for getting app, the internet connected to dumb devices. So alarm clocks and photo frames and that sort of stuff. And this was before the iPhone existed, so pe the word app didn't exist. People didn't know what apps were going to explain it to them. And so we built a hardware platform because there wasn't something out there that was a smart alarm clock back in the day when we started the company. And <clears throat> one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to get the platform out there as broadly as possible. So open sourcing it really made sense because we wanted to lower the barriers to people 
uh, adopting the platform. And people, you know, it was all about ecosystem building. You really need an ecosystem around the product to make it successful. Um, so that's why we built it. Well, uh, the Spark Fund, at least, it, it was a nine year process. It wasn't overnight that we said, we're going to do open source hardware. It was uh, kind of, it grew, and we said, maybe we could share some of these designs and other folks could benefit from this. And then what we realized is we could use it as a, a business advantage. So by open sourcing our designs, we enable our competitors to copy us, right? So within 12 to 14 weeks, our competitors can copy a device that we come up with. Well, this means that that forces us to innovate. It forces us to create something new every 12 to 14 weeks. So where other companies sort of say, oh my god, we've got to patent everything, Spark Fund says, you know what, we can't patent anything because then we would sit on our laurels. So we use open source as a market driver, as a business model. And it's been fairly successful so far. Um, for me, it was a very, uh, very pragmatic choice. And, and in, um, thinking about this space as an individual, um, the way I see it is that open source hardware uh, provides you with a clear um, development structure that gives you uh, speed and agility and low cost. Um, so just being able to kind of not deal, not worry about um, the IP universe, I mean, eliminates a tremendous amount of kind of heartache and time and energy. And so you can just kind of get rid of all of that investment worry about when you think about starting a hardware business. And as the community is kind of organizing and structuring itself and articulating what open source hardware means, um, you now have increasingly kind of this platform to build upon and this community um, to kind of uh, interact with and kind of a, a, a kind of noble goal also that you can feel like you're part of and kind of ad advocate for. So there are lots of Lots of pragmatic uh, benefits as well. And that's largely why I chose the path. I mean, all of your businesses are, are various years old or months old, as the case may be. But I suspect that for each one of you, when you went out and you said, okay, we're going to do open source hardware, there must have been a moment where you expected, you expected the business to look like this, the people to react one way, but you got some sort of strange, we talked a lot about the community, some community feedback that you didn't expect or that's, that you said to yourself, oh, well, that certainly wasn't anything that I would have expected. I mean, what, kind of, what kind of strange, unexpected things have you seen that come from the fact that you are focused on open source hardware? Strange thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, I think um, one of the crucial things that happened, and I'm, I don't know if this, this is because it was open source or just because I was showing it to a lot of people. So I, I, I don't know where the line is drawn, but um, in the very early days of Little Bits when I was starting, I imagined it as a prototyping tool. So it was a way for you to be able to create an, an object, a prototype if you're a designer or an architect, um, in three dimensions that had light and sound and sensors without having to be an engineer. And I imagined the prototyping and the design market to be kind of who would be interested in this. And I started showing it around um, at a lot of these events that are, you know, more focused on open source hardware, you know, things like Maker Faire and stuff like that. And suddenly I started seeing that actually kids were very interested in it. Parents would come up to me and say this is actually a very important educational tool. And uh, teachers would come up and say we really need this in classrooms, so how can we help? And so I don't know if it's particularly because it's open source or not. And at the time there wasn't really much to share. Uh, but uh, but the, 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 the feedback from the community was definitely a very, very important driver because I shifted. I shifted the sort of focus of, um, of, of the, the, the platform uh, to another type of user and felt like there was really an opportunity to make impact uh, at, on kids at a very young age. So that's, that's kind of my experience. I would say on the, on the axis of strange, I mean, there's, there's two stories I can relate. One is um, uh, one day someone linked me to a video and the alarm clock I designed had sprouted legs and was walking because someone had gone and taken the plans and put legs on it and it started walking around. <laughs> That's pretty strange to see your design walk in. Um, I would say strange probably more from the pragmatic sense. One of the things I didn't expect that would happen is that when I put my schematics and designs online, I got unsolicited quotations for manufacturing from lots of people. 
Um, so uh, people were running, because normally when, when you start business, you have to sign an NDA, you have to exchange all kinds of documentation, all sorts of stuff, and there's a lot of barriers. Finding the true price um, for the market becomes very inefficient. Um, people would come to me and say, oh, you're using this health accelerometer, you should use mine, it's cheaper. And I say, well, what's your price? And then I talk to that guy, well, that's, this guy was 50 cents, you should give me 40 cents, and you just go back and forth. And everyone, it's sort of the, the, playing, the, the playing field's clear, right? Everyone knows what everyone else is doing, and you actually get a lot of control over the process because all the other guys know, the other guys knows that they see the same bomb, they see the same pricing. And so that was one of the, I guess, less expected benefits of going over. Uh, by going open source, have you guys heard the term mashup, where you take multiple songs and you mash them up? Uh, by kind of releasing our files as open open source hardware, um, we're seeing these fantastic mashups, right? That we we sell the bits and pieces to folks, and then they come up with a new product, and then they use our files, mash them together, and create a product that never would have been a consumer product before. Uh, it, I have countless examples that are all just hilarious that I wish they were consumer products but there's only one or two people in this world that need that product, and so that's why open source helps. Uh, it, isn't, it is no longer one product for all consumers. It is each consumer can have their own product, and so I think open source hardware allows for that nicely. Uh, two, two quick stories. So, so the first is that I think my um, project that, that I've been working on and talking about in this context is uh, an outlier, kind of weird one for uh, some other open source hardware folks. So I remixed an existing hardware design for um, the Arduino and turned it into a sewable piece of electronics. So that was kind of a weird, bizarre thing to do. Um, uh, so that's gonna be the first story. The second one is was really unexpected and kind of delightful to me is that the original designs for the sewable board that I did, the lily pad Arduino, was then taken and remixed by Chris Anderson from Wired and turned into the first board that he did when he was starting up DIY drones, um, which was super cool. I mean, I think they then went on to like design things from scratch, but that was such a cool like dev and like piggybacking and, and, um, and doing it all myself until I had kind of the first uh, you know physical thing in the world and I said, okay, now I'm ready to take investment. And I thought it was going to be I actually, no, I didn't think, I, I didn't know if it was going to be impossible or going to be very easy. I kind of had the ambivalent feeling. So um, when I started raising money, I started, uh, uh, and this was last June, I started speaking to some investors and there were, uh, there's there's two reactions you get to that. And they're, and I, in my experience, it's, it's sort of, it's really black and white. It's either you're absolutely insane, I don't know what, I'm, what you're talking about, goodbye, or uh, this is awesome, I think, um, I, this is awesome, I really want to support it. So um, the, the people that I first started speaking to were people that were saying, you're insane. And it was a lot of them. And uh, I was going around in, um, in New York meeting investors and stuff like that. And I kind of got depressed a bit. And, and then I went uh, on vacation uh, to Beirut just uh, for a week to hang out with my family. And then one day I get an email from um, someone who I, I, I'd known in another context, but who was uh, the, uh, the ex-CEO, he, he was the CEO of Creative Commons at the time, and big, big believer, Joey Ito, big, big believer in open source. Um, and he basically told me, uh, are you raising money? And I said, yes, actually, I am. Do you know anyone interested? I didn't think that he would be, and he said, yes, me. And he ended up being my lead investor. So, um, and then through through Joey, started meeting other investors that, that believe in that same mission, and so it became, the, the open source gauge became a way to kind of uh, to to weed out the investors that I I'm not I'm not, I'm not going to see eye to eye with anyway. So it's better that you know this is a conversation that happens quick and and you get it over with and you speak to the people that are in the same kind of camp as you. Um, and that was in September. Now we're actually launching um, a, another um, a fundraise, and I'm much better at. Uh, knowing who to talk to from the beginning. I, I look for that particularly. Uh, it makes it harder because the pool of investors that I can talk to is much smaller. Um, and plus combining wanting somebody to believe in hardware as opposed to software and web, plus believe in open hardware, plus believe in uh, you know kind of a, a, a hardware that's predicated on having like, multiple products, etc. It makes the pool very, very small, but, um, but so when we, hopefully um, find the, the right the investors, they will be uh, the perfect ones. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm hopeful, I'm excited. I think, I think there's gonna <laughs> that's, that's what opens source hardware. That's why I feel it's important.
I, I, I would say, I would just to dovetail, it's not hobbyists, it's people are passionate. And passionate enough that they want to get really into it and go back a layer. They're not satisfied with just what they got off the shelf, right? They want to improve it somehow. And the frustration that you get with closed source hardware is that the moment you really love something and you want to get to know it better, it doesn't love you back. Right, because it's closed and, and you can't open it, it has nasty labels on it, and, and you're going to get sued for opening it. The great thing about open source is that it allows people with a passion to really dig into it and, and peel back as far as they want to get and, and really do something that sort of adds to the community or does something really cool like big shooting flames and have trampolines. <laughs> Besides telling them that they could make a big shooting flame the trampoline, uh, which is probably compelling in and of itself, but how do you how do you find more people who want to do that kind of who want to have that kind of control or ability to modify their devices? I mean, obviously, you do it in part by reaching out to people who are already engineers or, or engineering inclined. Who who here doesn't want to modify something around them? Who here doesn't get aggravated by the devices that they use, that the, the, the chain on their bicycle isn't long enough or squeaky or something? I mean, we all come across those problems. Um, I think by opening it up, we at least give you the chance of fixing it yourself or modifying it to become what you want it to be. Within the, um, the broad kind of hobbyist landscape, also, there are, I mean, almost everyone does some sort of creative thing. Um, uh, you know, almost everyone that I know, whether that's flower arranging or knitting or, you know, building crazy electronics or woodworking. And I think that's the impulse that this movement taps into. And, and in thinking about kind of the broad kind of hobbyist market, we can think about places like, you know, Hobby Lobby and the woodworking store and Joanne's Fabric. and in addition to Radio Shack. So I, I don't, I mean, to kind of reiterate some of what we've been saying already, um, I don't think we have to be confined to electronic, electronic spaces. Or, I mean, although in addition, I think there's room for the electronic spaces to grow into um, some of these other communities as well. So I, I think, yeah, there's still many places to go, even if we just stay in the kind of hobbyist, kind of creative person space. It's a, strange, it's a strange word. I mean, I I was doing some part of the fun of raising money is you have to like price the markets. So I was like trying to size what the market, the hobbyist market is, and it appeared to be a very small market. It's like a thirty million dollar market or something. And I and and for you example, I am not hobby electronics. For, if, if hobby okay, electronics. Because like hobby yeah. lobby is no, just no, of course, you, RC yeah. hobby. It's all electronics particularly, which is you know supposedly what I was trying to like. A pitch to, but for example, I would not uh, be included in that market. And after I started reading more and more, I was like, how can I be? You know, there are all these assumptions that are made that I think are totally wrong, and um, and that's why it appears to be small. It's because the labeling is weird. And w when when um, even before Little Bits became a product, there was a page on the website um, that I called Dream Bits, and it was one line of text that you could write in what uh, what is a uh, what 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 would you like to invent? What is the little bit that you would like to see made? And I never thought anybody would really put things in it. I, ha I thought I had to see it and all of that. And, and every day now we have tens and hundreds of, of, uh, of submissions, things that really like you would not even imagine. From people, from people who are retired engineers, people who used to be in the Navy, kids who are, in their, uh, who are you know, doing uh, 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 choir practice and they came up with an idea for something, uh, stay-at-home moms, there's really all sorts of ideas from like, I want to build a triple axis accelerometer or like a hover bit to uh, I want to make a fart alarm, you know? So there's, like, <laughs> there's just, you know, and the person who said I want to make a fart alarm may or may not be able to make it and they're not going to be with that category, you know, they're not going to be called that, but it's just, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I kind of really disagree with that uh, sort of, you know, compartmentalization of people. I think people don't dare to call themselves inventors, but everybody is, essentially is. Yeah. I, I, th I think also sort of this notion that there's like, this discovery of the hobby market is sort of a, a sign of how, I guess, like first world this country is. Because, like, <laughs> like uh, it's a, sort of like the thing I, if you saw Wally, -E, where like the people forgot how to walk because they always had these things that shoved them around on the, on the spaceship. <laughs> and, then they, and then they have to eventually discover they can walk. If you go to other countries, 
right? I mean, just fixing stuff yourself is just the way it is, right? I mean, you know, people have the cars in Cuba from like the 1930s and they're still running because they have to fix it themselves. They have no other option because the ecosystem is so close to them. You go to any, any country where, um, you know, you don't have this wonderful service economy and everything sort of delivery <coughs> and works and everything's beautiful. You, you just, it's just a survival skill to be a hobbyist. Everyone is sort of a hobbyist, right, in those countries. And, and so I think people are sort of discovering actually that it's very natural for us to be that type of way. We're all sort of cavemen in our own way and we draw on walls and we innovate. And that's very, it's very native to it the way we think. So I think it's a potentially very huge market. It's just a matter of sort of relabeling and understanding that this is actually a very natural thing to do. It's not, it's not sort of a, a curiosity geek weird thing. Um, but just to get that, give another small uh, anecdote that is a little bit of an indicator of how and where these things are reaching. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a woman contacted me recently um, yeah, she's really into dog shows, and so she shows her dogs, and she dresses up her dogs in costumes. And so she was in touch um, to see how she could kind of embed electronics into these costumes that she was making for her dogs. So a kind of crazy, um, out of the blue connection that I never would have thought Did you was ever think lily pads would be. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 kind of so but, but so. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff happening out there. So, so I asked you half an hour ago if there were any strange or unexpected things. You know, like, that's crazy. And now you have dogs and trampolines that shoot fire and, uh, and fart alarms. Fart right. Alarms. There you go. <laughs> when you when you uh, when you look at the world, are there are there spaces that you think lend themselves more or less to open source hardware? Are there areas that you say? This is, this is an obvious fertile place, or even this is a place that maybe we want to tread lightly, and that'll be the, the, the fourth or fifth round of, of, of areas that open up open source hardware, or is it kind of a, you know, anything goes in situation? I think anything that you can sort of uh, attach a design file to trades nicely in the open source world. So this table, if it had a design file, we could transmit that and kind of share that. Um, anything that, um, I, you guys think, like the medical world, like medicine, I, I don't know that that's the right place for open source hardware. That would be a fourth or fifth generation <laughs> application. Yeah, yeah I, I, I could definitely agree. It's safety and health. There's a, there's functional functional and warranty issues there that yeah. would definitely be. Uh, yeah, somebody uh, has to be liable. Uh, <laughs> you want you want to make sure it's working well, but it's sort of like you don't go to a plumber to get your heart fixed. Right? You go to the <laughs> so it's. Um, um, but uh, I, I I mean I generally think that. Um, uh, everything that is, I mean, unlike software where it's all intangible, anything that's hardware is measurable and reverse engineerable. So even if you don't think it's open, it's open, right? So the, the, the question I, I would turn on the other way, is there anything that cannot be open that is closed? And I think everything that is closed can be open anyway, it's just a matter of will and interest. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, why not just, let's, let's cut to the chase and just ship the schematics with it anyways and save it a lot of trouble. Can you talk a little bit about your community? A big part of the <coughs> hardware is the, the larger community, but then with any company, you have a community that you're, that you're fostering, that you know you're dealing with, that you're, are your most rabid users, are the ones who give you those ideas, who give you that feedback, who, who dress their dogs up with, uh, with clothes that light up. How do you think about that community, and how much time and how many resources do you put behind just fostering that community for, for the fostering sake, for the community's sake? I think for uh, it, it, that's an interesting question because it does it isn't necessarily uh, specific to the open source hardware world. Um, my business fosters its community very very carefully because our customers are the most important thing to us. And so just with any company that sort of engages them on the forum or answers the phone call or sends a nice email, that's really important to business. Um, so uh, beyond that, um, I think. The open source community is a little interesting because uh, they all play nicely together. We all have this want to share. You know, you ask anybody about their project and they'll talk all day about the thing that they're building because they really want to show you what they're working on. So um, I, I think uh, part of it is business aspect and then the other half is the community really loves to interact. 
um, as a, a different and much smaller scale, that kind of take on that question being one person um, supporting a project initially. Um, when the project launched, um, I was super psyched to get feedback from the community and getting emails from people, kind of hearing about the project, kind of helping them tr troubleshoot was like super fun and awesome. And then, you know, like a couple of months go by and you get like the same email like five times and you're like, well, this is what you need to do. And then it's just like, after a while, it's like, I really can't spend any more time doing this. <laughs> and I kind of just stopped. Um, and the community, the rest of the community really at that point was large enough and kind of um, robust enough to pick up the slack. And that has been an interesting experience. I mean, in large part now, people probably go to Nathan and go to um, Arduino forums. But um, that's been as like a small scale participant just in this universe, an individual, the community picked up a lot of that support slack that I wasn't able to provide. And finally, there was a little bit mentioned in the last panel and I want, this is the, this is the business panel I wanted to bring up with you. Being open source hardware is being open, is being open source hardware, but isn't necessarily being open everything hardware. You don't, you don't share every single thing. You don't necessarily tell anyone where the best suppliers are. So how do you try, how do you walk that line? How do you decide what you share and what you don't share? And what is the, what kind of feedback do you get when you make that sort of decision? Uh, I've uh, had to answer that question a couple times. And what I boiled it down to was um, whatever doesn't benefit the end user, we're going to be generally less transparent about. So the design files will allow you to be more successful building that widget. Uh, but getting the Spark Fund financials, right, that doesn't, being transparent about the business financials doesn't help you succeed as an end user. So uh, depending on, we are more transparent as it helps our end user more likely to succeed. Yeah, I, I, th I think the, the analogy I like to use is I, I look, hardware is the lens through which the designer's creativity, creativity is focused on the user, right? So to the extent that you want to create a, a dialogue between the user and the designer and get the feedback, you want to make the lens transparent. So everything that the user can hold in their hand um, is something you want to share with them because they want to be able to look back and see what the original intent was. Can I ask, answer another question? You can answer whatever question you want. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered that the, the question was asked in the last panel and I wanted to say something, so I'm gonna... Yeah. Um, I wanna say it before it ends. Um, the question was asked about kind of uh, the role of policy makers and, um, um, and the law um, and you know what is uh, and and in, in specifically in the context of manufacturing and the, and the power of, U of uh, manufacturing in the U.S. etc. Um, I'm I'm always interested in these. I used to be interested in these discussions that happened about you know what's what's happening now that China's taking over manufacturing in the world and what is the role of the U.S. etc. And I don't want to turn that into this discussion, but I I, I want to say that um, you know manuf the U.S. has lost. Um, has lost, it's not losing, has lost its power to manufacture. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's paper thin now. No, no, I'm talking about the industry. I, um, it's, it's just, I, I think it's important to kind of face things and, ex and, and accept them and that's how you can change them because now, right now, on, in January, I tried to make 2,000 little bits kit, uh, kits and it was Chinese New Year. And it was the hardest thing. I think throughout the four years of me working on Little Bits, that month was the hardest month of my life because we were we couldn't find a surprise that could do it. We couldn't find the quality that we wanted. We couldn't find the uh, the know-how that we needed. It was um, maybe maybe it was partially us, but we were at that point we're a funded company. We have money. We have time. Where where you know if if we couldn't do it, of course like a a person that's an individual couldn't do it. And so I just want to say that uh, you know we have to accept that fact now. And it's not that open source hardware is important or it's nice or it's cool. It's urgent. It is crucial. It is the only way that this, and I'm not American, and I, but I really believe in this and I think it's really important for America to get this back, is that this is the only way that the country will gain back its, um, its, its sort of agility and its innovation and its, um, its, uh, its, its creativity and impact on the world um, is through this channel because w this, the system, the infrastructure uh, that, that's in place is not working and has kind of lost us a lot of these skills. And so, um, you know, really trying to get policymakers and the law on, on the side of, of this 
uh, goal as opposed to the side of corporations because you know like we saw in banks one corporation fails everything fails you can't you can't hedge your bets on, on large corporations it has to be kind of the larger goal and so I'm, I'm just I'm, I just want to say that this is you know it's, it's it's nice and it's all happy go lucky and everything but but I personally believe that it's 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 crucial and it's the only shot we got and we have to focus we have to help each other do this and um, whether American or not, we have to help each other do this and, and kind of save the country. I would I I would say I, I, I strongly agree with your sentiment. I mean I I've I've moved to Asia, right, because there's this unfortunately this country is kind of desolate in terms of hardware. I mean I I think every policymaker in the United States needs to get a ticket to Shenzhen, and you stand on the bridge of Hua Bay and go, holy shit, we're going to get our assets handed to us. These guys <laughs> are so, every like visceral, you, your whole body gets filled, filled with like the commercial energy of that place and the, and the innovation and the energy. Everyone there is just focused on, on building business and trade and so forth. It's, you don't, there's no place in America that has that feel anymore about it, I think. It's, it, it, we're so gentrified, I guess, something, I don't know what it is, I haven't figured it out, right? But um, <clears throat> that ecosystem doesn't exist here, and part of and for all the all the, all the sort of the value who we have about their poor IP protection and all that sort of crap, a lot of the reason why they have this ecosystem is because they don't they don't have to worry about copying stuff really. I mean, it, if <clears throat> every day that I worry about somebody copying me, every day that I go after somebody who's copied my design is one less day that I'm working on the next big thing. Yeah, right. And, and so I, it, it's just a distraction. So we, we just face forward and put our head down yeah. and go. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and those guys out there just go ahead and say, this guy's making a buck, I'm going to make a buck, and, and we're just going to do it, and we're going to compete. And, and they, manage, they, they manage to scratch money out of hard earth. I mean, because, because there's very little IP protection, you also have very little protection for your own investment into the thing. Everyone's sort of flying without a, a safety harness out there, right? But uh, that really makes everyone sort of really get pedal to the metal and really engage and work hard. On the other hand, there's this notion in the, in the U.S. that you can create protectable businesses, right? I mean, in like in the in the heart of every venture capitalist beats a monopolist. They want a monopoly, right? That's why they're investing. They want a protectable monopoly. They want a hockey stick. Uh, growth curve, and they want the monopoly through patents, they want monopoly through, through copyright, they want monopoly through proprietary lock-in, they want monopoly through crypto keys on their devices, like everyone wants protectable businesses because it's more profitable, it's more, it's more safe, you don't have to work as hard to protect these things, and the U.S. Has, has a great system of laws that actually can, you know, allow these monopolies to exist, and, and, um, and that sort of runs counter to a lot of, I mean, the open hardware is, is, is sort of no mistake we're a bunch of sort of viewed as maybe fringe or smaller because we're not part of that larger, we don't, we don't have incumbent businesses we're trying to protect, right? We're trying to grow new businesses, right? And we want to create ecosystems and you want you know, low barriers to entry and so forth. And so, um, you know, it's not that I'm anti-big business. I love big businesses. They, they, they provide me lots of good things, right? But... Um, I bet at some point in time there's going to be there is going to be sort of a confluence of sort of, co of conflict of interest between what some small companies want to do versus what big businesses want to do, especially as open hardware becomes bigger and more gets a bigger footprint. And that's where I think legislation really starts to matter is to be able to protect the interests of the smaller firms and to not have um, small innovators overwhelmed with legal work, paperwork, and protection. And, and all this sort of stuff. I mean, I, the, we were talking with Phil and Lamore, and one, one piece of advice I gave them, I says, consider that you need to plan on taking 5 to 10% of all your revenue and spend it as a tax to protect your business. Hire a lawyer, get insurance, but you should always budget you know, some amount of money, essentially as a tax, to sort of, it's not really a real tax, it's not legislated, right? but if you don't have a lawyer, if you don't have insurance, you're going to get wiped out. Right, it, it's it's really it's really you're really flying without a parachute at that point in time. They're really really expensive compared to you know prototyping and so forth. And you have to sort of budget this money to do it, and that's a burden upon small business owners. And a, lot, a lot of small business owners who didn't have the foresight to get a lawyer or to get insurance um, will find themselves burned sometime down the road, um, and they they just flame out and go out of business, and that's a problem. I think. Uh, uh, 
it, it's really, I, I really want to thank you um, for putting this together. I think it's really important, and hopefully there are people in the room that have, you know, that can start to affect change in this way. But I think at every at every juncture um, over the past, you know, while um, the law has chosen to side with big businesses. Um, because they've been very good at providing metrics, at saying we employ X amount of people, we turn around X amount of revenue, uh, we